What's it like to have to take cover as rockets rain down on your city? We'll talk to somebody who was there in Ashkelon as they report from Jerusalem on this episode of The Hot Zone. This is The Hot Zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holden here. I'm still on vacation, still enjoying every minute of it. But I wanted to take a minute and talk about what happened over the weekend in Israel. Uh, Gaza, uh, the Hamas terrorists inside Gaza, fired over 700 rockets into Israel and killing four Jews in the process. And then Israel retaliated with uh, something like, I don't know, dozens of airstrikes, killing 25 uh, over there. And some new developments in that Uh, coming up. I'm going to talk to a special guest that is coming to me directly from Jerusalem to talk about the problem. Check it out. So I've got Julie Stahl on with us today from Jerusalem. And uh, Julie, you were in Ashkelon when the rockets were falling, correct? Yes, I was. Uh, my cameraman and I, Jonathan, we, we were, went down to Ashkelon. We actually went to the, a house uh, where a rocket had fallen in between two houses and shrapnel flew up and actually flew through like 30 feet through a window of a home and killed a man. And he was the first person killed uh, since the 2014 uh, war between Israel and Gaza. But yeah, so we were there when the rockets were falling. We had to run for cover four times. Three times it was in the same bomb shelter in somebody's home. Once there was no bomb shelter, so we just had to kind of crouch by a wall. But yeah, Mm -hmm. we were there. (laughs) Wow, exciting. And um, not very exciting for the people who are getting their homes destroyed. No. Uh, No. Tell me about uh, your experience in Jerusalem. How long have you been there? uh, You know, how is this different from everyday life? Wow. Uh, I actually have lived in Israel tomorrow, 32 years. (laughs) Wow. So, um, yeah, and most of that time is in Jerusalem. Um, You know, on the one hand, life in Jerusalem is is like life anywhere. You you do laundry, you clean your house, you go grocery shopping. On the other hand, you know, there's always the there's always a tension of uh, kind of I sometimes I say I'm like part of the most hated peoples of the world, you know, Jewish, a believer, a woman. Sometimes, you know, you feel like really you're in a you're in a, a zone where nobody likes you. But um from day to day, you know, we, we go on yesterday, obviously, I, I mean, from the, from the minute I started uh, dealing with people in the day, even people in Jerusalem and, you know, we weren't hearing alarms in Jerusalem, but, um, everybody was like tense and, and upset and you say, how are you? And they say, fine, except what's happening in Gaza. So, you know, it's a very small country. Everybody's connected. And, uh, so it, everybody feels the pressure. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Now, uh, when you've been down to Ashkelon before, this is uh, actually more everyday life for people in that area. I've been to Sderot, where there's a bomb shelter like every 50 feet down the down the road. Is Ashkelon like that as well? No. Ashkelon, people have uh, shelters in their homes, but they don't have them on the streets. And I was actually, I was noticing that yesterday. They don't have them by the bus stops. They they get less rockets than the people in Sterot, but they still have a fair amount of, uh, you know, of rockets. And really, I mean, we were talking yesterday, like, what country in the world would would have one rocket come across their border, yeah. let alone 700 rockets fired at them in 48 hours. Right. I mean, that's crazy. It's and, crazy. And people people kind of go out and kind of, it's almost like checking the weather, like, no, not a lot of rockets today. It looks like, okay, we're, we're probably okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. But now no, you've got you know, children we, that are going, out, that are not going to school. You've got, uh, you know, transportation that's that's hampered and uh, lots of problems that are caused by this. Uh, what is the role of Iran in all this? Well, we're, we're finding out that really Iran has kind of funded, you know, funded Islamic Jihad and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Uh, one analyst was saying that that 
Iran really wanted um, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad to rev things up uh, so there would be no kind of agreement between Hamas and Israel. Not that Hamas and Israel are ever going to have a real agreement, but uh, Hamas leaders were in Cairo when um, when the, when this all started. And it started, of course, when um, Palestinian Islamic Jihad snipers fired at Israeli soldiers and Israel struck back and killed two, two people in, uh, in Gaza. And then the whole thing started. We were yeah. talking about it today. You know, uh, there, there was a siren in Israel, uh, all throughout Israel on Thursday for two minutes marking the Holocaust. And literally 48 hours later, the rocket started with sirens warning people to run in their shelters at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. So 48 hours later, it, it, it's quite uh, jarring in a way. Oh, without a doubt. Uh, now, you're right about that, uh, that it's, it's impossible for Israel and Hamas to come together because it's hard to have discussions with people who deny your right to exist. Uh, yes. And the there, there's now a, a ceasefire in place. Um, but my question is, do you think this had anything to do with the start of Ramadan? Or it seems like right around the start of Ramadan, they usually have some agitation down there, uh, whether it's, you know, hey, let's we got all these extra rockets. Let's, let's quick fire them off before uh, Ramadan starts <laughs> so where we can't do any work or. Uh, hey, if we fire them off now, then we can really win the media battle when Israel strikes back because uh, there, we can say, oh, here we are, you know, in our holiest month and, the, and Israel's bombing us. Uh, what do you think? That, do, you, do you think it had anything to do with that? It's possible. I, I mean, there are oftentimes more terror attacks during Ramadan. Somehow it sort of gives them power sometimes. I'm not saying that against Muslims in general. I'm just saying for yeah, anybody no, who wants to it. carry out terror attacks, Ramadan sometimes is their month of choice. Um, I don't know if this particular thing did. It, Ramadan hadn't started. It's just basically started today, last night, today. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we'll, we'll see what happens in the next few days. So there were, people said actually more like from the Israeli side that um, Hamas wanted to, or Islamic Jihad wanted to rev things up before um, Israel's Memorial Day is Wednesday, Independence Day is Thursday, and next mm. week, I know most Americans don't know about the Eurovision Song Contest, but it's a huge international event. Israel is hosting it this year, and that they wanted to kind of disrupt things in order to extract kind of humble Israel and extract some things from Israel before that happened. Now, do you feel like the politicians in Israel are, I mean, I, I read some of the comments when they announced the ceasefire, and it seems like some Israelis were pretty upset about that, that, you know, here we keep giving concessions to these people and they just want to kill us. And, and why do we give concessions to them? We're laying the next attack at our own doorstep. Do you have... What are people saying about that? Yeah, I think I think probably most of Israel today is saying like, what did we just do? I think a lot of people, including myself, thought thing thought Israel was going to go further than they did this time because uh, one thing was usually they don't uh, present a diplomatic kind of argument. And yesterday they were sending out names to the press. Hey, you can talk to this person to get Israel's side of the story, and this one. And I really thought things were going to go further. They did actually go further than they have in a while. They targeted leaders, which until now in recent, like in the last year, they've only targeted uh, sites, you know, mm -hmm. terror sites or mm -hmm. weapons manufacturing sites. But they actually targeted people yesterday. I, you mentioned Iran before. One of the people that they targeted was the man who was responsible for bringing money from Iran into into the Gaza Strip. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I'm always very struck whenever I'm there at the stark difference between Gaza and the rest of uh, 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 the rest of Israel. Um, when you see when you when you read in the Bible where it says, you know, God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. If you just look at uh, drone footage of Gaza, if that's not what cursed land looks like, I don't know what is. And it just seems like um 
you know, even even within Israel, when you go to the places that are primarily populated by uh, people who are not friendly to the state of Israel, uh, I won't say Muslims in general, but uh, or Arabs in general. But when you go to those kind of neighborhoods, they are they're not in good shape. They're not well kept. They're not uh, they you know, they're not well manicured or anything like that. And Israel is such a beautiful place. And it's always striking to me how how stark that contrast is. Um, do because you're you're a Jew, right? Yeah, is that yes, correct? Yes, I am. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, do yes. do Jews um, kind of also believe that uh, this, this this biblical passage that God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel? Yeah, I think it's not something people hang on to uh, all the time. You know, it's not something like, well, if you bless me, you're going to be blessed. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I can tell you a story about the Gaza Strip. You know, uh, more than almost 20, no, about almost 15 years ago, Israel uprooted 9,000 people in a dozen or so communities that had been planted in the Gaza Strip, Jewish communities, in what was called the, the disengagement. Now, those when those communities were planted there decades ago, after 67, um, the Jewish people came, and actually the local Gaza residents at the time welcomed the Jewish people, and they said, you'll never get anything to grow here. And sure enough, they made these communities and they were gorgeous. They were like these beautiful oases in the desert and they grew produce that was uh, exported to the, you know, to mm -hmm. the whole world. Well, mm -hmm. then, you know, what happens? Israel decides they're going to try unilateral peace and they rip up the settlements. They leave. And the day they left, I was there the day before they left and the day they finally pulled out. And when they did, there was like there was like nothing left. They had destroyed it. The Palestinian Authority asked Israel to destroy the homes, which they did because they knew their own people would fight over them. Mm -hmm. And. And like, I remember seeing this, uh, this little boy, like, like they were dragging away just pieces of rubble, like it was some kind of treasure. And it was like that. It was like, that was exactly it. Israel took the blessing with them. Mm -hmm. There was nothing left. And wow. even Israel, like rich Jews in the United States, bought the greenhouses and gave them, like gave businesses basically to the Palestinians and they destroyed them. You know, wow. I mean, it, it was it, it it really is what you're talking about. Uh -huh. And, you know, I mean, I mean, I feel bad for the people that are there. I feel really bad for the people that are under Hamas and Islamic Jihad. You know, people mm -hmm. want to. People scream about Israel and, and saying, you know, how they're oppressing the Palestinians. The Palestinians are oppressed by the terror organizations and yeah. by the corruption. And, you know, you couldn't get too many people to say this, but I'd be pretty well sure that most Palestinians would be really glad if Israel would come back and take over. At mm -hmm. least the ones that remember what it was like when Israel was there. Now, Israel doesn't want to do that because right. they don't want to rule over all those Palestinians. But, you know, it, it's uh, it's not a good situation for them. And it is what you said. I mean, it's like they took the blessing with them when they left. Interesting. Now, when you listen to the media uh, in the United States, especially, and, and I was looking at like uh, the Daily Mail uh, online today, uh, everything they're reporting about this is really one sided. It's look how badly Palestinians are getting hurt by this. And all the photos they're showing are of little Palestinian kids in front of rubble strewn streets that were probably rubble strewn even before all this happened. Um, you know, any injuries or deaths that they show are going to be Palestinian on the on the Palestinian side. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've seen very little reporting uh, other than from the IDF themselves and from you guys mm -hmm. about how badly Israel has been hurt by by these things about the I Israelis that have been killed and, and that sort of thing. And then you have American politicians uh, on, on the left who are. Uh, saying, you know, how much more killing does Israel need to do before we finally have justice? When, you know, true justice would probably be, uh, like you say, just bulldozing Gaza and starting over, but nobody's willing to do that. Um, yeah. So how does that make the average uh, Israeli feel 
when they see the one-sided coverage and how do they feel when they see your coverage by contrast? Um, I think it's really, sorry, they're kind of practical people. And I think at this point, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say they're personally hurt or even surprised by bad media coverage. They're just kind of used to it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it happens. Um, they're, they're very grateful, though, for, for um, coverage, for friends, for people who reach out to them, who report things accurately. Um, yeah, they're very grateful for that. Yeah, that's good. Well, Julie, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope you'll stay safe over there and keep sure. pumping out some good good reporting. And thank uh, you. tell, tell my, uh, my buddy Jonathan that uh, I said hello, would you? Okay, I'll do that. All right. <laughs> He'll be happy to hear from you. Thank okay. you. God bless you. Bless you. All right, take care. Bye. Bye. You too. So imagine having to live in a city where you had to dive into a bomb shelter every few minutes just because some random group of people that live near you decided to throw rockets your way. People that you've never met, people that you've never had any ill will toward or done anything negative to trying to kill you just for the simple fact that you live where they want to live. You know, it's it's really disheartening to see that kind of terrorism take place. And it's actually pretty amazing to see how much the Jewish people uh, just hold themselves back from wiping out Gaza because they could if they wanted to. If, if they wanted to just take care of the problem once and for all, they could just wipe Gaza clean and start fresh. But as civilized people do, they allow themselves to be bombarded and they, their response is always measured. Um, and many people in Israel right now feel like it's a little too measured. So I guess we'll have to keep watching and see what comes of this and hope that it doesn't bloom into open war. For the, in the meantime, I'm Chuck Holton, and you've been watching The Hot Zone. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.